Lovely, thank you very much. And Paolo, you mentioned the word joy, which is just a wonderful way to start the day, I think. So joy to you all this morning. It's an absolute pleasure to join you, seeing some faces familiar and many that are not. So I can't wait to get to know you better over the course of the next two days. I myself left the lab over 10 years ago now, so I definitely have no uh, more claim to being in academia. But um, as Francesco said, I do work uh, on the commercialization end now as founding partner of Web3 Venture Studio, The Building Blocks. And one of the pieces of technology that we are most excited about is smart legal contracts. I should mention that I am joined by my partner, Niall, who's in the front row here with me today and who can join for questions uh, either at the end or over coffee, depending on how we're running on time. So we've spent a lot of time over the course of the past years thinking about smart legal contracts and what they can do in a very broadly applicable sense, not only for financial services, but for many different industries. They have an incredible applicability in terms of breadth and both depth. But today, obviously, we're going to focus on what that means for FS. So why are we so effectively obsessed with smart legal contracts? Well, effectively, they're incredibly ubiquitous things, contracts, right? Basically, 100% of financial transactions are governed by legal contracts. We can't really get around them. So they're incredibly ubiquitous and therefore uh, important to innovate. But they have a few really big problems with them. First of all, is that they're incredibly time consuming to set up, to manage, to execute against. And in fact, in the context of new financial deals, they account for almost a fifth of the sales cycle of any major deal, be it an M&A deal, a loan syndication deal, etc. So that's an awful lot of time that's being spent just on getting the contractuals right, never mind actually doing the work and creating the value. Now, over seven out of every 10 businesses say that they actually cannot even find at least 10% of the contracts that are currently in place governing agreements that they have. That's kind of scary and something that we need to be addressing. Third of all is that due to mismanagement, they actually can lose up to 40% of their value. That's for some companies, literally billions of dollars. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Of course, there are many more problems with contract management in general. We just don't have enough time to get into them today. So what does this mean tangibly for businesses in the financial services sector? On an average billion dollar M&A deal, you're looking at almost $200 million walking out the door just on getting the contracts sorted. Companies spend an average of $3 million a year making contracts that they already have in place all over again because they can't find them. And the management of contracts, even in an ideal world, averages for a medium to large size financial institution around $50 million every year. Last year alone, the top 10 firms in the sector lost an estimated $10 billion to this problem. So clearly it's quantifiable and very real and therefore something that needs to be addressed. And those numbers are just in an ideal world. These types of things are when the wheels come off, right? If someone has actually committed a breach of regulatory compliance, for example, a supplier or a party has missed a governance goal or a supply deadline, maybe a consumer or supplier has missed a payment, or there's a dispute around where liability sits inside of an insurance policy, for example. In all of these instances, things get a lot more complicated and a lot more costly very, very, very quickly. The costs just massively rise versus that 50 million of standard contract management that I spoke about a moment ago. So all in, poor contract management costs around one to 10 billion every single year. And so when you've got something that is costing the sector so much money and is such a clearly defined problem, of course, what do we like to do, especially in academia and especially us builders, we like to try and throw technology to solve the problem. And indeed, we're seeing, as we are seeing across every single sector at the moment, we are seeing amazing applications of artificial intelligence to try and solve at least a piece of this puzzle with AI. And indeed, we're seeing some great applications of AI which are concentrated actually at the beginning of that contractual life cycle. There are many tools out there to help uh, faster and better drafting of contracts. But what happens in all of those sort of scarier situations when you actually have to execute, manage, and govern. 
the non-ideal scenarios. That's where we feel that smart legal contracts can play an incredibly useful role in governing all of those complicated situations. So what is a smart legal contract in simple terms? It sits at the convergence of legally binding agreements and programmable logic, which means that at least partially, it can be an automatically executable contract. Now, the contract itself can either sit on or off chain, and of course, there's a privacy sensitivity around that, depending on the information that's contained within the contract. And it can also leverage data that is either on chain or held in centralized servers, depending again on privacy needs, regulatory needs, such as GDPR compliance around PII, etc. So at the building blocks, as I mentioned, we're a Web3 venture studio, and we're building in a vertical agnostic way. We're very excited about the tokenization of real-world cultural assets, and we're focusing our energies there at the moment within music and film. But of course, we also uh, would like to expand that further, notably into the art world. We're looking at the combination of DLT technologies and AI for the opera operationalization of companies and also at B2B and B2C applications in FinTech. But not to focus too much on that, what we realized as we were building out these, these vertical companies was that there are a lot of duplicative efforts when it comes to building core infrastructure that every business actually needs to make the Web3 economy a safer and surer place to do business and indeed get those, those first billion people on chain. These are three examples of some of the foundational technologies that we're working on. And of course, today we're focusing on the smart legal contract system. We'd love to talk to you all about the others as well um, over a coffee. So we call this regular tech, and it's effectively the first of its kind as an end-to-end privacy-preserving smart legal contracts system. And what I mean by end-to-end -end is really that we are going from the inception of the contract, be it using an existing legal contract that is not yet smart, using that, ingesting it, mapping it against a data structure model or indeed using templates to create a new smart legal contract from scratch. We've been working hard to codify and create templates uh, for the 33 prescribed clauses from the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. Uh, I think we're up to about number 15 out of the 33. I'm looking at Niall for an update. Um, so we're, we're working very hard to templatize and make sure that we have effectively, if you'll pardon me the, the self-indulgent pun, the building blocks to to be able to create those, those contracts from scratch. And from here, of course, we're applying natural language processing to be able to actually create, uh, create things that are machine readable as well as human readable. As I mentioned earlier, the data storage can happen on or off chain, not gonna walk through all the different permutations of it. And the data sources can either be completely internal and proprietary, be that sort of consumer risk profiles for lending, whether that's supplier payment milestone is something that's incredibly sensitive and needs to be kept potentially in a centralized uh, storage solution, or indeed third-party data or completely public, publicly available information. The execution of the clauses themselves can happen on chain in a completely transparent way, although obviously for privacy preserving purposes, that isn't always the, uh, the way that, that clients will want to go. So we can also hash, uh, create a hash of the, the clause execution and that's what gets re recorded on chain. For scale, we're combining it with non-legally binding computable contracts to help automate things like payments, dispute resolution, and even notifications. So in the case of a consumer, for example, if the interest rate changes and that has an impact on a consumer lending product, they will receive automatically a notification of what the knock-on impact is tangibly for their cost of living day to day. So we're incredibly excited to be implementing this uh, in a commercial setting for the first time with our latest venture to join the portfolio, which is a company called Amplify. The Amplify have been around for a number of years in the financial services space, and they're really all about making financial products and services more understandable for the everyday consumer. They have a natural language processing platform which effectively takes, for example, terms and conditions documents and makes them more understandable, takes that long 
dense block of jargon away and gives them more sort of natural language that they can understand to help, help dr drive financial understanding and inclusion. And they're kind of building on that now with uh, a user engagement system which presents uh, contract clauses and almost a, a more gamified UI to help bring people more into a journey of understanding the products and services that they're consuming because it is still largely for the every man and every woman quite an impenetrable space. And so we're coming into, uh, into Amplify and we're going to be implementing regular tech SLCs to help drive... Uh, um, compliant, uh, compliance to the Consumer Duty of Care Act, which is recently launched in the UK, uh, helping Amplify's clients to, to effectively ensure that their customers not only understand what it is that they're signing up for, but also record that understanding on chain for transparency and audit purposes for regulators further down the line. So we're excited to get going with, with Amplify. Uh, and we're working very closely with the Financial Conduct Authority to make sure that that is done in a regulatory compliant way. Amplify have actually been long-standing partners in the FCA Innovation Sandbox uh, in the UK. Regulation is obviously something that's really important to us. We are in it for the long haul. We want to build these foundational core pieces of technology that are going to help mature the Web3 economy and also help the Web2 financial economy to innovate uh, because we know that the trust that lies within Web2 institutions and those brand names that have been around in some instances for hundreds of years, that has value. This isn't about replacing all of the actors that have gone before. It's about giving, giving them the tools to innovate and iterate. And so to that end, I'm very proud as well to announce today that we're working with former US ambassador to the United Kingdom, Philip Rieker, and his team at DGA, based over in Washington, which is the only US Congress-approved think tank in the, in the United States, to work on a piece of regulatory research for the Web3 space in order to help inform the incoming administration in, in the Oval Office in January. Um, and I'm delighted to say that we're doing this as well in partnership with our wonderful host, Dr. Tasker here and his team at UCL, so that we can make sure that we're driving regulatory compliance globally. And we would welcome conversations with all regulators in all jurisdictions because we're really committed to building technologies that are globally applicable. Lastly, um, as I start to wrap up, conscious of time, um, I want to touch on smart contracts for media. I mentioned that we are very heavily focused at the building blocks on the tokenization of real world cultural assets across media, across um, music and film. And these things are actually represented in the old world in incredibly complex legally binding documents. You have all sorts of right holders. You, in, in the case of a song, you have songwriters, you have lyricists, you have different musicians on a track. It's actually an incredibly complex document. And as we see the fractionalization of cultural assets come to the fore, there's going to be a need for a system that can govern what it means to own pieces of those, uh, of those cultural assets, trade them, and perceive revenue on them. Uh, we really believe that the fractionalization of, of RWA is going to be the use case that's going to drive mainstream adoption of Web3 technology. So we know that this is going to be important because this is effectively what the everyman, the people that wouldn't be sitting in this room here and indeed aren't sitting in this room today, care about. And so we're focusing this on the distribution of royalties. So once you've bought a piece of song, a piece of a movie, what does that mean for me from a passive income perspective as a, as a retail investor? How do I make sure that I'm not falling foul of regulatory compliance, especially if there's a securities element to the asset? And how, do, how does the company make sure that they're dispersing payments in a flexible way, proportionate to the holdings that each person has in that asset? This is a space that we've been working on for a number of years. We're working actively with the ISO standards organization to make sure that this becomes a standardized way of doing things for uh, the, cultural, the cultural economy. Uh, we're working quite hard to bring this into, into standardization. We're not quite there yet, uh, but it's, it's in train. So bottom line is, if you're in the financial services sector, if you're a decision maker, and you're looking around, as we all are, 
in business thinking, okay, where can I actually achieve cost savings? You can save anywhere between a million to a hundred million. That's a conservative estimate through the implementation of a smart legal contract system to help you reduce the manual labor and overhead of managing, of managing those contracts. So without further ado, thank you so much. I look forward to discussing it further.